spring is a very important time. The dandelions are the the punctuation to everything that's going on. Very important to to beekeepers in our dance with with Mother Nature. Hello and welcome to the Notes from the Bee Yard podcast. You're listening to episode two, First Stirrings of Spring, written and read by Colorado beekeeper Tom Theobald. I love this piece for two reasons. One, it's a beautiful example of how Tom's writing is grounded in observation of the bees and the Colorado landscape. And two, this is what beekeeping does. There's an invitation to notice, to watch the weather, the seasons, and the local bloom. My name is Laura Tyler. I'm the producer and host of the Notes from the Bee Yard podcast. And this is episode two, First Stirrings of Spring. Spring is a time of awakening, of rejuvenation for anyone in agriculture. The disappointments of last year fade as bright new calves and lambs spring up like prairie flowers as if by magic in pastures overnight. We swell with hope and promise and prepare to roll the dice with nature one more time. The colony of bees serves as a lens to focus the first subtle changes taking place, and beekeepers sense the shift of seasons early. In the depths of winter, most of my bee yards have been snowbound or landlocked by bad roads, and the bees have been on their own with little help from me. When it's cold, the bees cluster over several combs of honey inside the hive, this cluster getting tighter as the temperature drops. As they consume their winter stores, their bodies generate sufficient heat to keep this cluster above survival temperature. But because they are cold-blooded, any flight outside is limited by the air temperature. On the coldest days and nights, there is little movement other than a slow convection as bees on the outside of the cluster chill and force their way toward the center to displace their warmer sisters. Bees don't hibernate, though, and on any day when the temperature rises above 50 degrees, they can be seen flying in the vicinity of the hive. The beekeeping usually begins for me in late January or early February with the first warm spells of the new season. Roads dry enough to get into the yards, and I make my rounds to heft each colony. To these are given combs of honey saved from the previous year. At about this time, the queen will resume her egg laying deep within the cluster. Much as chickens begin to lay again in spring, the bees respond to lengthening days. Bees share a life cycle common to many insects. A familiar example of this cycle is that of the butterfly. Egg, caterpillar, which is the larva, cocoon, which is the pupa, and adult. The eggs, larva, and pupa of the bees are referred to collectively as the brood. Unlike many other insects, though, This brood is totally dependent upon the colony of adult bees. The brood must be maintained at a constant temperature, and a colony can only maintain a brood nest the size of the cluster on the coldest night. Any brood which lies outside the cluster will chill and be lost. In the larval stage, the young are prodigious eaters as they grow rapidly over a six-day period. They are dependent upon the nurse bees for their care and feeding. For the first three days, they are fed royal jelly, a high-energy substance which the nurse bees produce after consuming honey and pollen. For the last three days, the larvae are fed honey and pollen directly. In early March, unnoticed by most of us mortals, maples and willows begin to flower and workers can be seen returning to the hives with a pellet of pollen on each hind leg, often so heavily laden 
that they fall exhausted in the grass before the entrance. They always bring to mind a picture of little folk dancers as they walk across the landing board in their bright yellow pantaloons. Pollen is the sole protein source for feeding the larva, and the first appearance stimulates a dramatic increase in brood rearing. The accelerated brood rearing places even greater demands upon the stored honey, for while these early flowering trees can often supply abundant pollen, they produce little or no nectar which the bees can convert to honey. Although the land is greening, the end of winter is still a long way off for the bees, and the honey stores of the lighter colonies must be watched closely. And then one sunny April morning, I am greeted as I step outside by a golden nugget in the grass. This new arrival is the bane of my bluegrass friends and neighbors, and for some its appearance sends them into veritable fits of neurotic frenzy. They dig and cut and pull. They hack and blast and slash. They drench their lawns in deadly chemicals as if some alien invader threatened their very existence. But to beekeepers, this little yellow flower is something else again. The first honey flow of the season. The lowly dandelion is for us a compelling symbol that the rigors of another winter have been survived. In a few short days, the activity in the bee yards shifts from struggle to abundance as the bees begin to reap the harvest and load after load of nectar and pollen flow into the hives. Here along the front range, though, nature delights in teasing us. Winter reluctantly loses its grip upon the land. Warm and sunny dandelion days are interspersed with upslope storms which dust us once again with snow. As I go outside to do the chores at dawn, the frozen grass shatters underfoot like shards of glass. These spring storms are brief, though, and soon the sun returns. And well it does, for some of the greatest challenges and finest pleasures in beekeeping lie just ahead. Tom, that was beautiful. Is there anything else you want to say today, thinking about what you just read? Nah, I don't think so. I was thinking, though, as we were doing it, that I needed you when I was writing this to give me encouragement to say, yeah, Tom, that's a good sentence. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that you said that because I can tell that you're putting your heart and your soul into the writing here. There's so many lines in this piece that sound like poetry from the um, grass that is like shards of glass. Uh -huh. That's what beekeeping does to you. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> it awakens... The, those thoughts, those feelings, those uh, appreciations. So tell me a little more about the dandelions. What's so important that, to them to be keepers? Well, although the trees uh, bring in a minor amount of nectar and, and occupy an important place because they produce the first pollen, winter is not over until the dandelions bloom. And that was a serious problem for the first beekeepers in the 1860s. Uh, winter was just too long, and many of the colonies could not last until the dandelions appeared, because there were no dandelions. The dandelions soon came in, though, with agricultural seed, and began to establish themselves and and spread across the landscape and the winter survival improved for the bees. Without the dandelions, the first bloom of any consequence didn't come until later and was not nearly as significant as the dandelions. 
So what I'm hearing just in general and something that I can relate with also as a beekeeper is just this idea that beekeeping um, really tunes you into just basic stuff, the seasons changing, what time things bloom, different kinds of pollen coming out. Do you feel like beekeeping helped um, increase your awareness of that stuff? Oh, of course, yes. And I think the contrast today in the in the recent past is that we look for other explanations to winter losses or winter survival and ov- overlook how important the natural world is to the bees. And the dandelions are the symbol of that change of seasons. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you for listening to the Notes from the Bee Yard podcast. This week, I'd like to thank Janet Saratani at Zudio Studio for her beautiful work designing our logo. We publish new episodes on Fridays at noon. Join us next time to hear episode three, Working Toward the Honey Flow. In the meantime, hop on over to notesfromthebeeyard.buzz to subscribe.